Welcome back to the fire break. I'm Steve Wolf. As you know, the fire break is sponsored by Team Wildfire. We're using jet engines and AI and some pretty cool stuff to figure out how to knock fires back in their place, at least in the regards in which they threaten people and communities. And speaking of communities, I've got Annie Leverage with us here today, and she is a communication specialist for fire adapted communities in San Francisco, as well as having worked with several other organizations in firefighting and fire planning, fire mitigation, fire crew member, fire this, fire. If it's got the word <laughs> fire in it, you know, Annie's done as much of it as she could have at this point in her career. Annie, welcome to the show, and how are you? Thank you, Steve. It's great to be here. I'm, I'm doing well and really looking forward to this conversation. So tell me what you're working on. Yeah, so I was thinking about how to kind of condense everything into an elevator pitch because there's quite a bit of sort of uh, little fires going on in my life. Um, well, you, you good know, ones. Annie, like, <laughs> it, it, it says, like, in case of fire, do not use the elevator. And therefore, That's true. Uh, the elevator pitch, yeah. you know, not, not appropriate for, for long form. We're going to use Fair the stairs, enough. all right? Let's use the stairs. Yeah, let's yeah. Take, some, take our time here. So, yeah, I have the privilege of working in some really interesting parts of um, fire adaptation and sort of supporting people's relationships to fire and um, adapting better to them. Okay. Um, my main role is with the Fire Adapted Communities Learning Network, um, which is a national network of fire practitioners and community organizers and folks kind of working on the ground um, in their communities to try and increase fire resilience, um, fire safety measures, um, fire awareness, um, whether that be wildfire or different um, controlled burn and prescribed fire um, efforts um, and other mitigation strategies as well. So I work in communications primarily for that um, organization, which is part of a larger partnership um, that we call the Fire Networks. Um, which is also a national um, partnership that includes the Fire Adapted Communities Learning Network, the Fire Learning Network, um, the Indigenous Peoples Burning Network, and the uh, Prescribed Fire Training Exchange Program. So um, a it's a bit of an on. alphabet soup. Yeah, there's yeah, a lot in wow. there. There's acronyms for each one, too. So um, uh, spare us yeah. both, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but I did want to just get all those names out there because it's a pretty um, robust partnership that covers a lot of different aspects of fire adaptation and getting communities involved in their uh, in their landscapes and um, aware of how fire impacts them. So you're working really in education, which hopefully impacts public perception, public opinions. And that's super important because a lot of the things that people think are you know, the, the smarter people than me think are what we should be doing uh, with the landscape, you know, with prescribed burns, with fuel load mitigation and treatments, et cetera, are things that are unpopular, right? Well, why are you cutting down our trees? Why are you burning? Why are you making smoke, right? So right. In, unless, peop unless the work that you're doing gets done, the other work can't get done either. Because mm -hmm. until people are educated and informed about the science of it, they're not going to be on board with why these type of mitigation measures need to be undertaken. Without public support, you know, it's hard to get that work done. So describe what that challenge feels like to you. Yeah, that's. I think that's exactly right. There's kind of a – there's a lot of groundwork that has to be laid in order to, you know – make communities feel safe with these fire mitigation efforts. I think there's so much of the work that I do in public outreach and communications is being aware of how wildfires impacted people and how it might bring up certain emotions and real experiences um, that change people's lives. And so it's very important to, to be um, thoughtful and mindful and intentional with the way we talk about fire, um, particularly if we're intentionally bringing fire back into a place um, for good, um, it's a very sensitive sort of approach that needs to be taken. So I really appreciate what you're saying, that there kind of has to be this public comfortability, um, safety in place uh, in order to really be on board with some of these measures that we take to 
hopefully prevent some of the more destructive fires that could come through and impact communities more severely. So, um, so I try and take a lot of care in the way that I speak about fire, um, the way it gets introduced um, to our audiences. And, and we also try and bring in the voices of people that have been impacted negatively by wildfire and um, tell their stories and, and make sure that folks have a platform to to process what's happened, to, to be in community and find ways to heal. Um, and I think talking about it is part of that healing process. It's, it can get people on board. It's, it's neighbor to neighbor, um, which then spreads community to community and beyond. So, um, so yeah, I, I really try and be mindful and, um, you know, in our work, we also talk a lot about trauma-informed communications and, and ways of approaching um, communities in a way that's an invitation rather than an expectation to be, uh, to participate in anything. So you bring a lot of sensitivity to your audience as you breach this topic with them. Uh, so you're, you're treading lightly, although... You're going in there with a little trowel, even though you have a big shovel's worth of work to do. Yeah, yeah. I think there's, um, I don't know, you kind of have to find the inroads with people and find find ways that make sense, um, communicate with people in ways that make sense for them, meet them where they're at. And um, in this way, again, you can kind of build that sense of safety that can can actually contribute to more honesty and bigger conversations. So, yeah, I, I try and, you know, there's always a sense of sort of like um, of urgency of when's the next big wildfire, like climate change, like all these sort of impacts that feel really big and and imminent and um, and scary. And I think there's sort of the sense of things have to happen immediately, but also in order for people to feel safe, to engage with these kinds of concepts, we do have to kind of take our time a little bit and build trust, build a sense of um, awareness that can lead to longer term, more sustainable changes. So you have a lot of audiences that you work with. <laughs> if, if you're right, if, like if you're working with people who just got burned out, you're working with them for one purpose, right, that is, is part of the healing from that experience. Um, mm -hmm. But they're actually the people who are at least at risk now, right, because their their property already did burn down. So the, the fuel load factor of their home and their land has been reduced pretty much to zero. Right. Uh, whereas yeah. uh, other people that you're speaking with, you know, still have residual high fuel loads. Their house hasn't burned. Their land hasn't burned. And mm -hmm. so you're your messaging is going to be different for those audiences. So absolutely in, in the course of your day and with the number of uh, organizations that you have to remember the names of and the acronyms, <laughs> you know, how do you divide your, your workload and how, how much like freedom do you have in deciding, you know, what, what you need to focus on in, in any given day with, with so many different audiences and so many different messages to carry? That's a good question. And I appreciate the, I feel seen. <laughs> I feel like, oh yeah, you're, you're, you're able to anticipate all the different sort of um, folks in the mix here. Um, there are so many different types of communities that, that we interact with and engage with at different stages of um, relating to fire. And I think that that keeps my job feeling really dynamic. It keeps my, my work feeling really um, fresh and sort of like, I, I, mean, I mean, I'm a people person. I love to communicate. I love to have conversations with folks and really listen and really feel like I can meet people where they are. And so I guess for me, it's, it's a challenge that I really appreciate and kind of take a lot of energy from. Um, but, you know, from a sort of like purely logistical standpoint, since we do interact with so many different types of communities in any given scenario, kind of the way I organize that and approach it is rely on some of the tools that we have, um, that we've developed, that the Fire Adapted Communities Learning Network uses. Um, we, de we developed what we call the FAC wheel, F-A-C wheel, and 
Um, FAC, FAC is sort of this common terminology for fire adapted communities, and we use that in reference to a lot of the materials we do um, and develop. And so the FAC wheel is sort of this segmented wheel that we've created that represents a lot of different, or all the, not all, I hesitate to say all because there's so many, it's hard to <laughs> encapsulate everything, but it encapsulates some of the features of fire adaptation that we found to be um, in common in communities that are, you know, working on fire adaptation. And that could be anything from the landscape treatments that a community uses um, to mitigate their fire risk or the community services that, that um, you know, a city or a town has in place to support a community. Um, the business and tourism aspect, uh, the government officials aspect. So there's like all these sort of like considerations um, that we've included into this FAC wheel. And so that's a tool and a really great visual that we use. And I can, I'll, I'll send that your way so you could Please, include it. And it. yeah, um, it's a, it's a great tool that we can kind of use as a conversation starter with communities to kind of get um, a sense of what they're thinking about, what they're prioritizing, what they're valuing at any certain stage in their um, in their relationship with fire. So we have that fact wheel as a really wonderful tool, and we've also sort of um, augmented that tool in different ways to um, support a different community's plans uh, for their fire adaptation. So um, I rely on those a lot, um, and... Yeah, that's good. You know, we got to start somewhere and see what people right. respond to, you know. Right. And so do you simultaneously work through different organizations? So, yeah. Um, so what the Fire Adapted Communities Learning Network does, it essentially provides this, like, network accessibility to different fire practitioners around the country. So okay. we're kind of this... Um, space for sharing stories, for sharing resources amongst practitioners that they can then bring to their on the ground community organizations. So we interface a lot with individuals that represent organizations on the ground, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, but that's just the specific work that Fire Adapted Communities Learning Network does. Um, right. right. Because I have sort of this portfolio of other roles, I'm happy to talk about those as well. <laughs> so are these essentially clients of yours? You could call it that. We refer to them as members. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. Members of the network. So yeah. where do you feel, you know, given that, uh, you know, come the end of your day, your week or your life, you want to feel like you've had, you know, the most impact you could have had. Where do you feel like the effort that you apply is most effective. Like when you're talking to mm. people that are actually listening to you, that are actually following your recommendations, that are actually following through on the things that they said they would do to improve the safety of their communities mm -hmm. versus the time when, you know, you're just billing hours and really not much coming out of it. Yeah, that's a great question because sometimes this work can feel so huge that it's hard to see your impact in it and again these issues feel so huge and scary and imminent but the work does take time it takes sort of this patience and another sort of part of the the work that I do is work with the um, prescribed fire training program mm -hmm. um, it's also commonly referred to as TREX which is sort of a combination of training and exchange and TREX programs um, have been around for a while now. I think the first one was back in 2008, and it's uh, essentially an intensive two-week training program for folks to get qualified and get experience with prescribed fire. Okay. Um, this is the practitioners? So these would be like fire bosses or community fire teams that actually go out and light the fires? Yeah, exactly. So they're, they kind of serve a couple – several different purposes. One of them is to get sort of qualifications for folks that might be working on an agency level. And another is for community members to be involved and volunteer and sort of also feel empowered to understand what fire looks like in their communities. Um, it's a bit of an access point that, um, 
that, you know, maybe community members might not have, say, with like Forest Service wildfire modules or something. There's the TREX program is kind of this interface between communities and the more sort of organized fire world, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and the TREX program has really taken off. Um, it was initially sort of funded by the Nature Conservancy as a program to um, to get more people qualified and sort of spread a little bit more, um, you know, educational value in prescribed fire and get more people sort of trained up in those uh, in, the, in that area. And it's really grown to the point where there are TREX events hosted not only around the country, but internationally as well. Mm. And um, there's also an additional aspect to the program, which is the women's TREX women in fire training, prescribed fire training exchanges. And um, those were sort of born out of an, a, what the women taking part in TREX programs and also taking part in wildland firefighting noticed about a need that they felt to feel part of a community and feel like they were a represented and valued member of the fire world. Um, so a person that I work with closely is Lenya Quinn Davidson, and she um, sort of seeded the program and kind of helped it take off and become what it is now. The We call it WTREX. And this is a long answer to your question, but what I, I feel very connected to this program because um, as a female identifying person, it, fire can sometimes feel like I'm not sure quite where my place is in it. Um, well, you're more than a female identifying person, right? You're actually a female. So. Yes, I am. Yes. <laughs> um, and there are lots of people out there that don't necessarily feel like they have a place in fire. And mm. this program is an effort to try and make that place for them. Um, and so the WTREX program is um, it's kind of where a bit of my heart lies because um, it's really an effort to to kind of find a space for women and other underrepresented genders in fire to have a space to get trained up, to find qualifications, to make networking opportunities, um, and to feel empowered uh, in their experiences in fire. So at the end of the day, like the fact that that WTREX program has grown into what it is now, I mean, there was a W Trex in Portugal uh, a couple really? weeks ago. There was one in South Africa. We're hosting one in the state of Nebraska next month. So um, the program is really spread and developed, and the feedback from participants has been, um, you know, I found a place in fire, and I feel like I have um, a community that was not as developed as it was before. So um, to me, that really makes me feel encouraged that there's you know, a, a variety of backgrounds that can now come into this space and offer their perspectives and their um, their values to um, to the world of fire. Yeah, and and uh, you know, as I as I comb the literature and the on on online presences of different organizations, you know, uh, virtually every orientation, you know, has its own fire group as well if you were to mm -hmm. move down the lgbtq etc list like yeah there are there are little micro segments that are you know what what they all have in common is that they're firefighters yeah right or, right. or, or, or mm -hmm. fire interest and i think that's really interesting um, yeah so so the w tracks is really like giving you one specific area where you really get some satisfaction out of the progress that you see happening mm -hmm. and and you know positive association with it for yourself. Yes. It's also one of the places or one of the opportunities I have to actually interface with fire and mm -hmm. use a drip torch and um, be operational in a prescribed fire. You know, my, my day-to-day -day work with the fire adapted communities learning network is much more sort of communications oriented where I'm, you know, putting out newsletters and working on social media and more of the sort of like uh, movement building behind the scenes. Um, so W Trex, I'm out there in my gear <laughs> and having a blast. Let me ask you then about the market segmentation aspect of this. 
uh, because you said you're doing, you know, community building, movement building, um, and and yet the the community seems so so fractured, in that you have all of these organizations that have the same goal, very similar goals, mm-hmm. um, and, and yet the the messaging is divided up as coming from so many different organizations. Mm. Uh, each putting their own spin on it and each uh, targeting their own target audiences. Yeah. How does that not get confusing? (laughs) Well, I guess the short answer is it does get confusing. And (laughs) it is, um, you know, it it did take me a a minute um, when I got into this field, um, which was not actually that long ago. It was sort of around 2020 that I was like, I looked outside my window, you know, I live in Oakland, California, and the sky was orange. It was like the sun didn't rise. (laughs) And I was like, what's happening here? Like, I need to know, I'm going to start looking into this. And I just opened, it opened up this whole world of land management policy and history and um, such an amazing story of fire in California and beyond. Um, And it took me a while to even get into this role and, you know, find opportunities that made sense for me as an entry level person in fire. And then it took me a long time as well to get down the acronyms (laughs) to like understand all the different players and the agency like roles. And there is so much to the world of fire and that is a wonderful thing about it. You could, you could, find your place really in so many different areas of fire, but it can also seem daunting and um, inaccessible and unapproachable. Um, And so what I really try and do in my work is be as clear as possible (laughs) and try and maintain a sense of like, well, I'm not just, I'm not going to assume anything about what people may or may not know. They'll, they'll let me know. And so it takes a long time or it took me a long time to feel like I wasn't confused and I want to be a person that is approachable to folks that are confused because there's no such thing as stupid questions in fire. Um, This is a very confusing and huge topic. So in terms of how I represent that in my work, you know, I mentioned the fire networks as this sort of larger partnership on a national scale that um, is a partnership between the Nature Conservancy, the Watershed Center in Northern California, the DOI and the Forest Service. Because we have this national scope, we have quite a bit of cover or territory to cover quite a different communities and audiences to consider. And so that's we do have this sort of um, approach of these separated fire networks within. So I mentioned the Fire Learning Network, Indigenous Peoples Burning Network, the Prescribed Fire Training Exchanges, and then my organization, the Fire Adapted Communities Learning Network. So we have it segmented out to a certain extent because um, while the goal is at its heart to encourage a better relationship with fire and sort of cultivate a more resilient culture to fire. Um, You can't just do that from one voice. There needs to be different places to approach it. Um, So yeah, another long answer to your question, but it's hard not to have long answers. Some people live on Instagram. (laughs) Some people live on TikTok. Some people live on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. The way you message for each of those audiences is different. Oh, yes. And some, and some, you know, shun computers altogether. The lucky, yes. Those are the lucky ones, I would say. And I would say that quite a bit of people that are out there burning are not on their computers. So that's a whole nother way to like think about accessing these super smart people that know a ton about fire and have stories to tell um, and getting their stories into the hands of folks that, that are on the websites and, and want so That's your segue that into the indigenous burning population, right? Yeah, I mean... Well, the Indigenous Peoples Burning Network is such 
a wonderful network. It's yes. um, stewarded by my colleague, Mary Huffman, um, who has done an incredible amount of work to try and make inroads with communities and make sure that folks that are not indig indigenous identifying know how to be respectful and appropriate and approach um, partnership in a very collaborative and invitational way. Um, so it's something we think we think very deeply about and really value. Um, and it's a very important part of our audience, for sure. Yeah, I agree. And, 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 and I think as we, you know, as we mine the world for new technologies uh, uh, to help us deal with wildfire, I think that the indigenous burning wisdom for, is probably one of the most fruitful areas to explore. Uh, if, if we look at it thoroughly, not mm -hmm. if we just say, oh, let's burn stuff. And that way there'll be less stuff to burn, you know, without having sensitivities about what we're burning, what time of the year, mm -hmm. like, like all of the subtleties that have taken people thousands of years to acquire. And exactly. Not, right. You know, that there's indigenous burning you know, going on, you know, particularly, let's say, Australia, New Zealand. Uh, mm -hmm. by, people by cultures that have been practicing this, you know, literally for thousands of years, uh, that understand the subtleties. It's not, you just take a drip torch to the ground and now you're doing, Hey, right. I'm doing indigenous burning. No, you're just right. you know, like <laughs> risking, you know, setting huge dangerous fires. Mm -hmm. uh, so is yeah. there a process, uh, as an outbound communicator for you to take in, uh, wisdoms of indigenous burning practices and then recommunicate those out to audiences that wouldn't have seen them or learned about them? Yeah, I think that's a really good question because, you know, ideally what I, the ideal situation is that indigenous fire practitioners are using their voices and their platforms to, to deliver that information. But it's also not something that we would ever want to expect or, um, or ask for that, for that labor, right? So there's like kind of this balance of like, you know, me as sort of the manager of these different communication platforms that are um, so benefited by indigenous voices and perspectives. It's like the balance between creating that platform and also like enabling it to be easy, to be straightforward and to be, um, to be beneficial for all involved. And so, you know, we work with some indigenous authors for this blog that we have. Um, and I just, I really appreciate the partnership opportunities there where it's like, okay, here's a platform, like here's an invitation. It's all about an invitation um, and making invitations in ways that are, that are received and understood. Um, so yeah, walking that balance can, can be, it's one of the most, I think, important parts of the work that I do because um, indigenous leadership is at the core of the the movement for for better relationships with fire. And so respecting that and acknowledging it is something I try and do in every aspect of the work because, you know, the history is there. It, we right. know we know that these thousands of years of experience and, and subtleties and wisdom and um, ecological and cultural knowledge is is there and it's valid and it's um, it's it honestly holds a lot of the the information that we need to to move forward with a better relationship so that we can. Yeah, it's it's I I, I suspect it's a whole you know no pun intended but a whole tinderbox. Um, if you look at the, you know, the history of our relationship with indigenous people outside of fire, right? Yes, fire is something we could come together on, <clears throat> but I certainly wouldn't think that it was out of the realm of possibility for people to think, wait, you stole our land, you stole our water, you stole everything. And now that you have a problem with fire, you're coming to get our advice. Yes. Yep. That's, I mean, that's exactly the sentiment that, that I want to acknowledge and sort of dismantle. Um, yeah. Because, how do you go about that? Yeah. that you know, how, how do you come back and say, you know, n now that we've ruined the climate and done all these other things, you know, now we're coming to ask for your advice, you know, right. I, I'd say go to hell. You know? <laughs> yeah. And you know, that's a valid response. I, I think there's, 
I wouldn't really say that. Okay. But I could see <laughs> how other people yeah. might feel like that. Absolutely. Right. I can too. And you know, there, there's, you know, like I said, there's validity in that there's, there's generational frustration and generational trauma that has been caused and has not fully healed. And I think there's a real responsibility that I have, you know, as a non-Indigenous person in, in a, I, you know, I have a certain degree of power in the way I'm able to communicate things. And so I really want to um, take responsibility and take accountability for the way that I, you know, can choose to have certain information disseminated. Um, and so I think in that way, like, uh, the leadership of Indigenous people is is critical, and it's it's sort of like an infrastructure that has to be collaboratively built. You know, there I can't just go in and say, well, I think this will work, and here's an invitation to to be involved and use your voice. It has to be in a collaborative approach to understanding like how to be effective. Um, in co-creating like a, a, a way to work together in, in fire. Um, it's many things aren't, aren't currently working. Some things are, and I think it's important to like step back and, and listen and take directives from, from indigenous leadership. Um, so yeah, I, I really value a lot of the partnerships and relationships I've been able to cultivate with some indigenous folks in fire and um, always appreciate any sort of knowledge that they're willing to impart. Yeah. Right. And, and probably a lot of what you get is based on how you ask. Yes. It seems like you have a tremendous sensitivity about that. Well, again, like even if you don't know the answers, you might not know culturally what the appropriate way to even approach the individuals or the conversations. But the fact right. that you know that you have to learn that, yeah, <laughs> step over just you got to start man, right. Right, yeah. I think there's that can just do more damage that than has already been done. Um, yeah, and so there are lots of really good sort of opportunities out there um, for folks to learn and to sort of start at an introductory level of like respectful ways to, to learn history and educate yourself and kind of start somewhere um, and build on those, build on that information and that understanding to a point where you can make invitations and in, in culturally sensitive and informed ways and um, uh, you know, do your best to like make those connections and also understand that they may not always happen. And so adjusting our work to, to be sensitive for, to those things, but never have an expectation um, is really important. Yes. I mean, I always go with, go in with the expectation that it's going to work out. <laughs> I go in yeah. with the expectation we're going to be friends, we're going to find common ground, and we're going to make progress together. Uh, that is certainly the best case. Yeah. In the spirit of, you know, begin with the end in mind mm -hmm. and, you know, mm -hmm. going in with the right heart. But I think that, uh, that, that common ground, like, okay, yes, we disagree about, uh, you know, how people were treated and historically, uh, but what we can agree on is that we care about our children. We care about our grandchildren. We care about the planet and, you know, what can we put aside so that we can work on that common goal together? Yeah. I mean, talk about thinking, working in fire and has really made me think of such like a hundreds of years into the future type or more, you know, like we really have to put aside the immediacy in in some ways, not in all ways. The immediacy is also very relevant and important, but there is something so powerful about projecting into the future. And, and that's another part of the work that we're trying to cultivate is sort of using one's imagination to like set an idea for what could be, you know, like, and it could be beautiful. It doesn't have to be scary. Um, and that can really be a powerful tool to, to 
to be motivated, to be inspired, to, to keep going um, in work that can sometimes feel so discouraging at times. Yeah, right. Yeah, you're, you're coming to an area where people already have so many feelings, predispositions, beliefs, some of which might actually be accurate and many won't, uh, but are still deeply held convictions. Yeah. Uh, so any, uh, you know, I could sum it up to say you got your hands full. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> a lot, a lot of work to do, but uh, you know, yeah. but I love that the, the way you're pursuing it and like you bring a, a real joy to the work. Uh, and Thank you. you know, a deep sense of commitment that that's necessary because you know, if you don't have a strong reason to do hard work, you're not going to do it very long. So yeah. I think the day you got up and you looked out the window and you saw the sky turn orange and the sun never came up and you realize like, Hey, this impacts me personally. I've got a stake in the future. I breathe mm -hmm. the air as much as anyone else does and right. I'm going to do something about it. So yeah. Kudos to you on that. Thanks Steve. Yeah, yeah. That means a lot. So what I would invite you said it, you talked about making the invitation, right? So what I would invite you to do would be to just uh, shoot me a note anytime you have correspondence that you want to get out, a message that you want to send to the community, and mm -hmm. we'll, we'll just dial up a phone call here or a podcast yeah. thing or whatever you call this technology. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and um, le if, if there's anything I can do to help you getting your messaging out, you know, I'd love to help. I really appreciate that. Yeah. I really respect the work you're doing and, you know, thoughtful questions and the opportunity to, to share some of my little corner of, of this huge world right. of fire. You know, it's not the most noticeable corner corner because you know, you don't have a lot of fire literally to put on the news. Right. Mm. You know, um, but the, the changing of people's attitudes and beliefs um, is really in the long term what's going to make the biggest impact on our ability to manage fire. So, mm -hmm. you know, the least glamorous, but maybe the most important. Oh, well, I'll take that. I'll take that. All right. That. <laughs> Great. Well, Annie, thank you so much for, yeah. for joining me on the show today. My pleasure. Thank you, Steve. Absolutely. This has been a conversation with the amazing Annie Leverage. Uh, from Fire Adapted Communities Learning Network and many other acronym, acronym <laughs> organizations, uh, but uh, the purpose is always the same. So thanks so much for joining me, and thank you all for listening, watching, or however you intake this this uh, medium and its content. Uh, I'm Steve Wolf. We're sponsored by Team Wildfire. Check us out on the web. And by the way, if you go to the teamwildfire.com slash podcast, you can find every podcast that we've recorded, even the ones that haven't been released onto the, the, the network yet. So I thank you for that. And thanks so much for joining me all. We'll see you next time on the fire break. Take care. <laughs>